welcome everyone to this conference. Before I say anything else, uh, you can switch on closed captioning by going to the bottom of your screen. You will see CC live transcripts. They have the option of hiding captioning or um, having it on your screen. A very warm welcome to everyone to this Autism Theology and the Church conference. We are excited about the conference. We are excited about the large number of participants who have registered over to well over 250 attendees. So welcome to each one of you. Before I give the floor to our first speaker, Grant Casco, I would like to give uh, some background to the conference and to the Center for Autism and Theology, which organizes this conference. And I will see, say a few things to frame the conference. Let me, before I do so, share my screen with you. There we go. So as I said, a little bit about background, the Center for Autism and Theology, the conference aims and questions, the schedule, and then I will finally uh, introduce the speakers for the first session. If you look at the literature on autism and theology or autism and the church, you will not find much before 2019. There were a couple of articles and books written, to be sure, and some were very good. Some also expressed some rather questionable theological views and quite dehumanizing views of autism. Other publications before 2019 include some excellent uh, practical resources, uh, in particular by Anne Mamet, Stephen Biedert, and Barbara Newman. In 2019, our first speaker, Grant McCaskill, published his book, Autism and the Church. And since then, a number of articles have been written in the field of autism and theology. Remarkably, in the past couple of months, a number of books have been published, and that was for us at the Center for the uh, Autism and Theology, a reason to invite the authors to talk about their work and to hear from them how they see the field developing. I'm talking specifically about Stuart Rapley, Dan Bauman, Cynthia Tam, Ada Campbell, and Claire Williams, who all participate in this conference. Another event that took place in the past couple of, a couple of years and that coincides with uh, the rise of publications in the field is the launch of the Center for Autism and Theology. The center is the brainchild of Grant McCaskill, and uh, he launched it together with colleagues here at the University of Aberdeen, John Swinton, Brian Brock, and I had the privilege to be involved as well. The center for Autism and Theology aims to be an international hub for autism and theology research. And even though it's an, uh, it's, it is a theological research center, we are keen to work interdisciplinary, which you can see from the uh, conference schedule. It does not just include theologians, but also scholars from other disciplines. And we are also keen to work in connection with the third sector, um, that is organizations, churches, and in fact, anyone who is interested in the topic of autism and theology. Importantly, we do not seek to replace the excellent work done before, um, for example, by M. Mamet um, and, and others, but to complement them with sustained theological work. So we, we aim to give a, to make a theological contribution to you what's there. Another feature of the center that I should highlight is that some of our staff and students identify as autistic, and we are keen to work with autistic people. I want to highlight this because uh, when we announced the conference, this was a question often asked, are there autistic speakers in the schedule, in the conference schedule? And the answer is yes. It was very important to us as organizers to have autistic and non-autistic speakers. As a center, we try to overcome barriers of misunderstanding between autistic and non-autistic people. So it's important to us. And we hope to bring that attitude of respect and reconciliation, if you want, to this conference. And we do ask therefore that all speakers, panelists and respondents, but also all the attendees, when you participate in the questions uh, afterwards, the Q&A, that you are respectful towards each other. That does not mean that we need to agree on everything. We probably don't. This is an academic conference and only by voicing different views and opinions will we all become enriched. But it is perfectly possible to voice your opinion in a respectful way. 
And we we really would like, we hope that we all embody that experience, uh, that, that attitude of respect towards each other. Related to that, um, we also ask for your understanding that the speakers come from a wide variety of backgrounds, geographically, but also disciplinary. Um, and that means that inevitably you will hear uh, particular terminology or views being expressed that are different from your own preference. Please know that all the speakers, respondents and panelists are trying to be respectful. No one will deliberately use language to upset people. And this brings me back to the beginning of my introduction. We noticed this rise in publications on autism and theology. And with this conference, we want to identify what is happening in the field and where the field is heading. In other words, this is a scoping conference. But having these conversations then also requires a framework, critical frameworks for evaluating what is helpful, what is unhelpful, what's theological sound, what's theologically not so sound, what do we need to question? So how do we evaluate the conversations happening within theology, between theology and the other disciplines, between academy and the third sector? So that's the second aim of our conference to identify and establish critical frameworks. And that brings me to the schedule for this conference. Um, I will briefly explain what kind of sessions we have in this conference, um, but without introducing all the speakers that will be done in each of the sessions. So the panel on Monday is with some of the recent authors in the field, and there's also a panel on Tuesday with uh, another recent author, Claire Williams, and also two people who, who work very practically in the field, uh, Bedart and Arnold. Around those, two, and so in a sense, to, that, that is where the, the conference began, that, and the idea for this conference too, to hear from those recent authors. And around that, we organized four talks. Um, there you see all the, all the um, speakers are experts in their fields, they are published in their fields, and the respondents have carefully been chosen to respond from their particular angle to the speaker. Then on Wednesday, we have a workshop um, from welcoming to belonging in which Kirsten Oliver will talk us through the practicalities that churches need to consider if they want to move from mere inclusion to places of really belonging where people are valued and belong everyone and on Tuesday morning we will hear from a church that does that very concretely that is centered on autism and the senior pastor David Teo will tell the story of that church the chapel of Christ our hope and then finally, this afternoon, at least if you're living in the UK, uh, we have a publishers panel because publishers are um, part of that field and, and some of them have expressed an, an interest in developing the field of autism and theology. And so we are, we're really uh, delighted that four publishers uh, have um, said that they wanted to participate in a panel and we will ask questions uh, like what gets published, why does it get published, what are you looking for? So on behalf of the organizing team and the Center for Theology and Autism, I wish you a wonderful and enriching conference. And with that, I will briefly introduce the speakers and the timeline for this session. So our first speaker is the founder of the Center for Autism and Theology, Professor Graham McCaskill. He is the Kirby Lane um, Chair of New Testament Exegesis at the University of Aberdeen, having previously taught at the University of St. Andrews. He is the author of several academic monographs on the New Testament and early Judaism. Grant will tell his own story in relation to autism. I will not comment on that. It is his story. I want to note here, however, that he has written several articles and a monograph that has been shaped by his story. And here on the screen, you see the front cover of his monograph, Autism and the Church. Grant will speak for about 30 minutes and then we will have a five minute break just so we can all process what has been said. And maybe you can just give your eyes some rest from the screen. And then Dr. Lisa Collinson will respond to Grant. Lisa will do that in about 10 minutes. Um, Lisa is the research lead for museums and special collections at the University of Aberdeen and her research background is in medieval cultural history and particular uh, literary, legal, and religious history. Lisa studied at the University of Edinburgh and later Cambridge, where she received her MPhil and 
her PhD, with the latter focusing on medieval writing about entertainment, including play and games. Her publications as author and or editor include several works with links to aspects of religious history, including the miracles of St. Magnus of Orkney, Old Norse myth mythology, seafaring beliefs, and church laws of Norway and Sweden. More recently, Lisa has uh, developed an interest in autism, and in 2020, she joined the advisory group of the Center for Autism, uh, autism and Theology, and we are delighted, Lisa, to have you on board. And um, this allows her to deepen her understanding of contemporary Christian culture. And she told me that's a process that she is looking forward to continuing during this conference. After Lisa has uh, responded to Grant, uh, Grant will offer a very brief reply, five minutes to Lisa again. And after that, the floor is open for questions and answers. You can type a question by typing them in the Q&A. And when you ask a question, you can tick the anonymous box in order to post your questions anonymously if you want. And uh, by email, you should have received instructions if that is not clear. Right, um, one more practical note. We have tried not to overload the program with activities and talks, and we've tried to provide decent breaks in between sessions. However, we understand that not everyone um, can participate in each session for whatever reason, or that during a session you want to lie down or just switch off the audio for a while, uh, and that's all perfectly fine. Don't feel that you have to attend every minute of the program. Similarly, in between sessions, you can join the Wonder Me Room. Um, that is um, a kind of socializing space, a digital socializing space. Please don't feel that you have to. It's just there. It's available. You can make use of it if you want, but you don't have to, of course. Grant and Lisa, I really look forward to what you have to say to us. And um, the floor is yours. Grant, over to you. Thank you. Let me just first of all say to everyone that um, I'm not going to be using any PowerPoint or any screen share during this session. So if you would rather uh, lie down and close your eyes and, and just listen, that might be easier than trying to focus on a static face on a screen. Uh, I'll also say that my cat may well invade the session at some stage. Uh, so I might get interrupted at some point during my own presentation to, to let her in. Um, my paper will have an autobiographical thread running through it, not because I think any of you will be particularly interested in my story, but because of how my experience is related to my own research and particularly to my own use of language. I was diagnosed as autistic about 18 months ago after several years on a waiting list, but I've known or at least suspected that I was autistic for probably a little over a decade. During that time, I began to write about autism theology in the Bible, motivated primarily by some strands of theological discourse about autism that are essentially negative in their portrayal and that I wanted to challenge. I'll say a little bit more about these later, but my experience of writing took place in a time where the discourse about language used in autism research and advocacy changed quite quickly particularly as a result of participatory research and autistic self-advocacy. In English speaking circles in the UK, and to an extent not yet adequately investigated beyond these circles, the widespread preference for identity first language has, I think, exemplified the issue and the structural problem behind it. The style guides generally enforced in publication contexts tend to require person first language, so a person with autism as a legacy of the personalism movement and its concern to protect the status of persons against dehumanizing assumptions about disabilities. It's considered respectful and politically correct to emphasize the person who did the person first and then to speak of their condition as something that accompanies this. In the UK, however, the demonstrable preference among actually autistic people is for identity first language, so an autistic person since autism isn't detachable from the identity of the person, from who I am. Similar preferences are visible in Anglophone contexts beyond the UK and in some Nordic contexts, but the research on these is more limited as far as I'm aware. Person first language is often perceived by autistic people themselves to be essentially negative 
about the characteristic, whether it's autism or something else, precisely because it's driven by the need to de-emphasize it or to play it down in relation to one's status as a person. You only need to do this if you think that the thing is a pathology or a deficit in some sense, rather than a difference. So we have a situation where researchers and practitioners consider it respectful to speak of persons with autism or children with autism, while most actually autistic people in the UK at least find this offensive or degrading as a way of speaking about autism. Published research has begun to pick up on this and to explore it, and publishers are beginning to accept that research may reflect this. But this is only a recent uptake of what autistic people have been saying for a much longer time. So there's a justified perception that neither research nor clinical practice as a whole represent the views of autistic people themselves. The research, most of it at least, portrays autism as essentially bad, something that needs to be fixed or overcome, and an industry has grown up around this. When I first began to suspect I was autistic, the widely used language for my characteristic was Asperger syndrome, and self-advocates would often use Aspie as their proud label. The process that led to my own diagnosis began with my flatmate, a medical student, talking about Asperger's in relation to a mutual friend who was subsequently diagnosed. By the time I started to write, this category had been removed from the Diagnostic Statistical Manual used in North America and was being discouraged in international contexts with autism or autism spectrum disorder, ASD, preferred or expected. Those who like to call themselves Aspies were understandably unhappy with this. When I first started to write, I went along with this. I went along with the expected language and with the person first requirement of APA style. Now, it may be important to say that I'm not personally as bothered by the use of person first language as many others. And that probably reflects growing up in a bilingual environment with a language that uses different constructions to those used in English. So if I were to say in, in my own language background that I'm an autistic person, I would say that there's, there is an autistic person in me, just as I say that there's a Lewisman or a Scotsman in me. I also know of autistic people in other language families who prefer person-first language because the ick ending or its equivalent is essentially negative in their speech. As well as this, I think the fact that I had some medical training as a vet uh, and married a doctor meant that I probably looked past some of the medical idioms and also past some of the associated language of normality in the research literature as simply reflecting statistical spreads rather than anything more pejorative. Now, please don't hear this as a defensive comment. This is com context for what I'm about to say in a moment. Basically, at that point in my life, I found that a lot of the research I was reading was helpful for me personally in its analysis of my traits, my own traits. Perhaps surprisingly to some, it didn't make me feel weird, but actually made my characteristics seem more normal, even when it was using the language of abnormal or atypical. I wasn't the only one to have these characteristics and I didn't need to feel as anxious as I did that some of the more difficult traits were personal failings. By the time I wrote the book, though, I was beginning to feel much more sensitive about the use of person-first language and other terminology, partly through exposure to the participatory research that had begun to emerge, and also through my starting to use social media, which I hadn't really done before. That exposed me to a huge amount of autistic self-representation that wasn't visible in the research, and that was, again, justifiably often angry about much of what is published. It also brought to my attention some of the research that hadn't come up in my searches and that wasn't referenced in the studies I was reading because it came from different research circles. But even then, much of this I only encountered after the book was beginning to go through the process of copy editing and typesetting and couldn't be radically altered. So my mind had been changed on some of the language I was using and on how it might be perceived. Some of that was through my own reflection and some was through challenge by others. Someone I now consider a good friend, the autism researcher and advocate Sarah Douglas, said they felt a little bit othered by my first article because of the medical terminology it used, and that challenged me. Sarah also helpfully challenged my personal weariness of using the word disability by thinking about context-specific disabling 
and its social aspect, so social model dimensions. So I'm now happy to describe myself as disabled and I found that really helpful in many contexts. And this brings me to the key point that's gonna lead into what follows. Through the process of writing, I experienced a certain amount of what we might theologically call repentance. Now, some will know that the background to the concept of repentance, uh, particularly in Greek with the word metanoia, which is not an exclusively theological one, but was a common idea in Greek literature, is that of a change of mind, sometimes accompanied by a sorrow for previous thoughts and acts. Repentance can designate a fundamental turning, a conversion moment, but it can also designate something habitual and mundane, a daily commitment to leaving behind wrong or just inadequate ways of thinking and being and rectifying any wrongs that may have accompanied them. Now, I think that's a really helpful place for us to turn to thinking about the language that we use in theological discourse about autism. Because while theology and biblical studies as an element within it has much to offer conversations about autism, it may also participate in language acts of which we come to repent. Our theological discourse may simply be inadequate for what we seek to think about, or it may participate in the kind of faceless structural evil that transcends the individual's activities and emerges from organization or social or societal arrangement or from the accepted idiom of a community. We may come to realize that we have simply assimilated medical discourse about autism into our own theological speech without recognizing the elements of it embody values incompatible with talk of God. We may re realize that to talk rightly of God demands that we talk differently about autism than we have done. We may re recognize the need to repent. And theology ought to foster a culture in which such repentance is expected and affirmed, where hostilities are gladly set aside after a change of mind. It ought to foster a culture of sensitivity where to where we have unwittingly hurt others by our choice of words and where we seek intentionally to rectify this. That's a matter of love. It ought to foster a culture of reconciliation and an expectation of healing in the relationships of those opposed, creating a generous space uh, for interactions. And that's a, a term that I borrow from the name of a wonderful Canadian organization that I spoke for a while ago. Repentance is not a terminal act. Repentance is a transitional one. Now, moving on then to thinking about autism, theology, and language. The disciplines of theology are particularly attentive to questions of language. Theology is God talk, and the various disciplines are governed by the question of what it means to talk rightly of God, which involves attention to both vocabulary and the grammar with which it's used. Some theological discussion has been focused on the constitutive significance of language for the knowledge of God and the encounter of God in humanity. Other strands of theology reflect on the limits of language and talk about God, the point at which the only way to say something about God is to negate its opposite and the points at which language must properly yield to silence, where non-talk is the proper articulation of love and awe. The particular disciplines of theological ethics and practical theology are distinctively attentive within this to the implications that our God talk must have for all other talk and for our consideration of all other things in a way that determines, or should determine, how we live within the world. These disciplines are shaped by a commitment to bringing the phenomena we encounter in the world into conversation with our talk of God asking difficult questions about whether a talk of God's self may need to be modified if it's to remain intelligible in the light of these phenomena, which may or may not be true in terms of the significance we attach to the phenomena themselves, and often challenging assumptions within the human talk of God that reflect the privileges and the experiences of the humans engaging in such talk. This is the dimension of the task that seeks to identify idolatry, the, project, the projection of certain human values onto God. So consequently, the theological disciplines are not static, even if they continue to be resourced by very old formulations. They develop through critical engagement that can, on pleasant occasion, be ironic, but that often involves polemic or even anathema. 
And given what I've said to this point, it can be useful to think about whether the polemics are motivated by the pursuit of a more appropriate way of speaking about God, truly about pursuing God's glory, or by a less noble desire to maintain human boundaries, to draw a clean circle around the insider and the outsider of our groups. And here, a good deal of theological study, particularly within the biblical studies that I principally contribute to, has drawn upon social scientific work, especially around group identity theories. In recent decades, this has been a particularly prominent strand in the analysis of evangelicalism, which many consider to be best understood as a sociologically defined movement rather than as a genuine theological tradition. Now, the theological discourse about language relates to this and intersects with the philosophy of language in important ways. And this is really bringing us to the heart of things now. In his 2016 work, The Language Animal, Charles Taylor, uh, perhaps best known for his philosophical analysis of modern secularism and its impact on ways of thinking about the self, broadly categorizes approaches to language into two families. First, there are those that understand language as a somewhat arbitrary act of labeling, where words function primarily as tags that are effectively neutral and easily swapped for each other. Uh, these employ a model of language that is essentially just a big dictionary. Words are tags and meaning always precedes these. Language has no essentially constitutive significance in relation to meaning. It simply inframes and designates and is arbitrarily localized in relation to historical peoples. Second, so that's the first theory of language. The second is that there are those that see language as having a constitutive function in relation to meaning and cognition. The words we use and how we use them determine how things are known and what to us they essentially are, what they mean. Taylor positions himself within the latter, and one of his key points is that this involves appreciation of the grammar and the syntax of a language rather than just its lexicon. The use of word order, of nominal cases, of main and accessory verbs, of adjectives and so on, all creates a set of relationships between the elements in a language event, identifying and differentiating, prioritizing and subordinating by turn. Language then is essentially relational, with the relationships occurring within an embodied reality that informs the language and is newly saturated by the language used. The warmth of physical contact between a child and a parent creates a linguistic world of warm and cold relationships. Language play, meanwhile, Sprachspiel, allows relationships to be recast and reinterpreted, sometimes serving subversive or transformational goals. For theological purposes, this attention to constitutive meaning is, in, is invaluable, and there's been a good deal of mutuality in the philosophical and theological work located in Taylor's second category. For one thing, the constitutive approach allows language to play its role and to reach the limits of that role in our experience of non-material meaning. God, goodness, love, mercy, these things transcend material reality, even if in some cases they emerge from it, but they can be known named and given quiddity by the way that we speak of them. For another thing, this allows such non-material things to be really recast uh, and allows these, those things to really recast the significance we perceive in the material things, sometimes leading to an ethically subversive act of language play. So when the Apostle Paul uses his language of God and says that God chooses the things that are nothing to nullify the things that are, it's an example of that play, flipping one set of embodied values about material goods and social status in light of a narrative about God's being and God's role enacted in the story of the cross. Now, here's the point. Taylor comments that the two approaches to language belong, in fact, to two very different understandings of human life. The first model of language suits the values of materialism and reductionism, which in turn connect to those of the medical models of autism. In these models, there are observable facts and statistics, and there are purportedly neutral words used to describe them. The second model of language, though, would recognize that the use of particular tags and the arrangement of them in sentences and paragraphs constitutes 
a particular set of relationships between them, whether intended or not. As soon as you describe someone as a person with autism, you imply a particular relationship. This linguistically constituted meaning, created perhaps in a scientific paper or a clinical guideline, determines the meaning of that which it describes for those who follow. Its purported descriptive neutrality is actually a programmatically constitutive one, and both theological and philosophical approaches to disability have recognized this. Now, I can illustrate this with two examples that are going to take us right into the language of autism and theology that I find problematic and that prompted me to start writing on this topic in the first place. But let me give a trigger warning that some of what I'm about to say may be upsetting because of how people have represented autism in the literature. Uh, the first is the one that we've mentioned already, the general insistence on person-first language in academic publications. This makes personhood independent of the condition in question precisely to protect personal status from being threatened by it. The language act represented in the word order, at least in English, and by the use of with, constitutes a separation, motivated by the perception that the condition is essentially negative. Linguistically, the condition becomes essentially negative for all who accept and participate in this language unless you happen to occupy a language where you do this with every personal identifier like nationality or ethnicity. The second example is related. In one strand of research into autistic phenomena, the difficulty experienced by autistic people in following the communication, especially the nonverbal communication of non-autistic people has been labeled as an empathy deficiency. Now, some research has flagged what it calls a dual empathy linked to neurodiversity. Autistic people find it easy to other, understand other autistic people, and non-autistic people find it difficult to understand them, even as they find it easy to understand each other. Autistic community can only be understand, sorry, communication can only be considered deficient if you normalize one of these communicative standards and don't allow the other to be part of a neurodiversity. But there's a further problem, which is the use of the tag empathy to label this understanding of one particular mode of communication. Linguistically, properly, empathy labels something emergent, a higher order capacity to understand and respond to the affective state of another person. Uh, it can't be reduced to one of the potential mechanisms by which that capacity can be realized. The phenomena of empathy are undoubtedly visible in autistic people who struggle with some forms of communication. They just arise differently. Now, the response to this from proponents of the language of empathy deficit is often that the term empathy is being used in a scientifically particular sense. But once that language is used it constitutes for its users a reality of autism in which the person with autism is considered subpersonal, is to them less than human. Peter Hobson, for example, uses the language of, of Dennett to indicate that the autistic people simply does not meet the conditions of personhood, that's his expression, unless they are trained into acting as a person through interventions, as in ABA. Simon Baron Cohen is reported as categorizing the autistic, oh, sorry, Simon Baron Cohen does categorize the autistic person with the psychopath, both of zero degrees of empathy, but the autistic maintain a stringent moral framework, so they simply don't do bad things. Elsewhere, he's reported as describing autistic people as seeing other human beings as just bags of skin, incapable of recognizing their humanness. Now, my point is that these rampantly dehumanizing descriptions of autism to use L. Loughran's expression, are consequential to a supposedly neutral choice of word that constitutes a particular reality of autism for those who accept it and don't resist it. Ultimately, what this means is that the person with autism is not really a person at all and is not capable of love. Now, the theology that prompted me to start writing on the topic myself utilized such accounts of autism a string of works, including some quite celebrated ones, use the purported autistic deficit as a way to highlight what is taken for granted in normal human interaction, normal. 
and to extrapolate from this what should be considered ideal, particularly in relation to the second person perspective of seeing the world through the eyes of another and relating to that one. Ultimately, the second person perspective that is considered absent for autistic people by those theological researchers includes God and one's relationship to God, so that all falling short of that relationship can be labelled a spiritual autism. The medical account of autism then has played a role in the development of positive relational theologies, but its role, its role has been a wholly negative one, contrastive of proper human relationality. Proponents of this approach have sometimes said that they're simply using the language metaphorically, but all metaphors are grounded in a reality characterized by the quality in question, the meaning of which they extend into the realm of a symbol. This metaphor could only be used if there's an underlying presumption that autism is essentially characterized by relational deficit. Now, my own contribution was intended to expose the normalizing tendencies within this approach. Whether successfully or not, I looked at some of the ways that biblical texts destabilize the social norms and their linguistic embodiments that underpin ableism, recognizing that the phenomena of ableism are traceable all the way back through human history and that theological acts of subversion can be renewed today. I looked at Paul, for example, and his proclamation that uh, those most will call weaks and weak and nothings are actually God's appointed means to nullify the supposedly strong and powerful. I looked at the imagery of the body, also as used in Paul, as a concrete image of mutual interdependency and diversity, giving a distinctively theological quality to neurodiversity. I looked at the concept of gift as the key to understanding economic value in the divine world. The value of anyone is not a function of their utility within a particular model of economy, but of their givenness by God with their particular personal purpose, their, their own telos within God's creation. All of these are examples of theological linguistics that refuses meaning finally to be constituted by normal social usage and insists on challenging our talk about power, value, love, and hope by talking about God. There were limits to what I did, and I've suggested in some more recent work that drawing on ideological criticisms like intersectionality and queer theory could be invaluable. But my work was at least a start on thinking about the theolinguistics involved, and hopefully it embodied the recognition that bringing the autistic-led research associated with neurodiversity models into engagement with theology is its own generative process. A theological neurodiversity is not the same as a non-theological one, even if there's no tension between them. Now, I'm not sure that I've seen much evidence of the repentance that I mentioned earlier, but that may follow, particularly in the light of some targeted critical essays by Joanna Leidenhag that have confronted the theological linguistic issues more overtly and intensively than I did. What I have seen, though, is the growth of literature contributed by actually autistic researchers, some speaking at the conference, giving an increasing mass and coherence to the counter discourse that's founded on this alternative linguistics. And in time, I think that'll change the discourse. It has to. So I want to close with two comments, actually three comments that are related to what I've just said, but also extend into other areas that I don't have time to explore. First, I suspect that some of the major contributions to theology through the centuries have been made by autistic people, not because there's anything in their stories that helps us to diagnose them, but because theology involves linguistic precision and autistic people tend to use and to prefer precise language. Personally, I don't like our tendency to speak of autistic language as highly literal, because that's really a way of speaking about referentiality and the use or the non-use of analogy. In my experience, autistic people are fine with metaphor once we appreciate it's there, and we're actually very good at using analogy because of our use of patterns. The real problem is, is with imprecise language, language that violates the rules. Sarcasm and irony are a problem because the meaning is opposed to the words used. Some metaphors are a problem because they're not properly framed. If we allow this, then the autistic use of language is one of the gains that autism constitutes for a community. And theology is a discipline that naturally benefits from this. So I think theological reality 
has benefited from autism. Secondly, I've not touched here on questions of silence or of non-verbalized responses to God, which have a particular significance in relation to non-speaking autistic people. Rowan Williams has written on this in his study, The Edge of Words, um, and I myself considered the place of the groans that words cannot express in Romans 8, 28 in my monograph. Our colleague Brian Brock has written more extensively on it, but I think also still much more needs to be said. Because I personally have not embodied that kind of autism, it's a point where I think I need to listen carefully to others in what they share through different communicative media, including the language that they prefer to use to describe it. So here, I'll just return to the point that theology, especially in non-Western contexts, has always affirmed the limits of language in knowing God and speaking of God, and has upheld non-speech as a worshipful act within the diverse economy of divine gift and reciprocation. And lastly, I want to repeat a suggestion that I made in the book, that if our language is properly disrupted the by theology, a space is opened up for talking about personal transformation and flourishing through addressing unhelpful behaviours by invoking theological categories of selfhood and virtue. And the key point here is that when these categories have already challenged human concepts of normality and social expectation, we can begin to think about what might help the autistic person flourish in their distinctive way within a divinely created neurodiversity. So not conforming to what people expect us to conform to or looking the way that, that others think we should look, uh, but living out our neurodiversity, but in ways that address and think about those aspects of our own behaviors that are, are difficult and problematic and stand in the way of our own personal flourishing. Um, that's something I'm very sensitive to myself. Uh, my own experience of autism, I wouldn't trade being autistic for being non-autistic for a second, but some aspects of it have been difficult. And there are some aspects of the behavior that I think are, are good to think about how we can talk about uh, addressing these and, and changing these uh, in a way that furnishes flourishing rather than conformity. Thank you. Grant, thank you very, very much for this uh, very rich talk. And um, you've given us a lot to think about, I think. I suggest that we take a five minute break and after that uh, we will hear Lisa's response. Back in five minutes. Welcome back everyone. Um, Lisa, over to you to respond to Grant. Many thanks. Um, Dr. Van Omen. Professor McCaskill and colleagues, thank you very much indeed for inviting me into this space and for giving me the opportunity to respond to Professor McCaskill's excellent paper as another late diagnosed autistic adult, although from a non-theology background. Over the next 10 minutes, I plan to address each of Professor McCaskill's main points in reverse order. Along the way, introducing a couple of additional thoughts on language sensitivity and on the term profound autism, which has recently been the subject of some public discussion. At the end, I plan to return to the question in the title. So I'll begin by clarifying how I think it has been answered by Professor McCaskill's paper. The title is Autism, Theology and Language, a game or reality, question mark. And according to my understanding, Professor McCaskill has answered this as a question which may be paraphrased as something like this. Autism, theology and language, are language experiences and choices of various kinds truly significant or not from a theological perspective? 
This is in itself an extremely important question. So my focus will be very much on the degree to which I understand and agree with the answers given, rather than on broader questions of game and reality, although these may be relevant and perhaps there will be a little time for this later. I'll begin with the end of Professor McCaskill's paper, which points to three potentially highly relevant topics, um, there, uh, or topics there were, was insufficient time for him to discuss fully during his paper. On his final point, um, I'll simply say that I would be very keen to hear more of Professor McCaskill's thoughts on the theological categories of self-food and virtue during the discussion following this uh, response, and I'll just leave that there. The next to last point was the significance of non-verbalised responses to God and the fact that, I quote, theology, especially in non-Western contexts, has always affirmed the limits of language in knowing God and has upheld non-speech as a worshipful act. My interpretation of this is that theology recognize, recognizes that non-verbalized responses to God may often be those which engage in the most real way possible with the reality of God. And I very much endorse Professor McCaskill's view that on this topic, the perspectives of people who express themselves without conventional speech, either often or in fact occasionally, are extremely important. Professor McCaskill's uh, first closing point, again in reverse order, was a suggestion that it's likely that many theologians over the years have themselves been autistic, and that this has had a positive impact on the reality of theology as a discipline. Well, as a non-theologian, I'm not co uh, qualified to comment on this exact suggestion. I would say that Professor McCaskill's general reasoning certainly makes sense to me as someone with a background in the related disciplines of philology and history of religion, which have always been full of people with focused or passionate or special interests, uh, whichever term you prefer, in both precise uses of language and its wider meanings. What I would add to Professor McCaskill's explanation for this is that for me personally, language has sensory aspects, which I think may have some relevance to this discussion. Perhaps this may connect to the idea of Im the embodied reality of language um, he discussed in relation to the work of Charles Taylor. In my case, uh, this takes a form of experiences which I think possibly, I say this tentatively, possibly come close to something like syn synesthesia um, and, to, and which can lead to bodily reactions. In other words, language shapes my reality in quite specific ways, both internally and externally. The impact of thinking about, hearing, reading or saying certain words and phrases is physically real, both in the moment and later through vivid memory. And this is one reason um, I tend to try to be quite careful with words and phrases. However often I fail, I do fail. Um, and one reason I can find it difficult when others seem less affected by the physical impact of certain words, either through pleasure or pain. Now, of course, my own experience is possibly atypical, but it certainly feels real and relevant to me. And I would therefore again, very tentatively suggest that the impact on some autistic people of hearing and reading language, which feels just somehow right or wrong, may be more profound than some realize with important consequences for autistic well-being. This brings me to Professor McCaskill's next point, still running in reverse order. Here he outlined how he had used discussion of certain biblical texts to challenge ableist language in modern theological scholarship, including terms such as spiritual autism, which rely on and perpetuate ideas that autistic people are less capable than others of forming full relationships with other human beings and by extension God due to a lack of empathy. Sadly, um, this reminded me immediately of some comments on autism, which I have encountered extremely recently and entirely coincidentally in wider discussions of thought and spirituality. The basic idea expressed, as I understand it, is that rich human engagement with the mysteries of existence 
is only possible through particular thought processes, much less likely to be used in their fullest form in autistic and other neurodivergent people. And the reasoning seems to relate both to a supposed lack of empathy and to supposed restricted thinking linked to narrow use of language in autistic people and others. What difference does this make? For me, it starkly underlines the fact that misleading ideas related to autism exist not only in academic Christianity focused theology, but also more widely in contemporary discussions of relationships between the human and the cosmic or divine or ultimately reality. And that this makes it all the more important that wherever these are found, this is carefully handled in the ways which seem most likely to lead to the best real outcomes for all concerned. Now clearly all concerned includes autistic people or as some people would express this, people with autism. Regarding this terminology question, I absolutely agree with Professor McCaskill's comments, um, both the point that in the UK at least there's a clear preference amongst autistic people for this formulation, which really should be respected, um, but also the point often expressed that this doesn't apply to everybody and individuals who prefer to refer to themselves as people with autism have every right to do so and receive equal respect. As a side note for myself, um, I very much embrace the term weird, which uh, Professor McCaskill mentioned in passing, but uh, perhaps just that's just me. Maybe we can discuss that later. In Professor McCaskill's paper, the discussion of the specific terms autistic people and people with autism was preceded by a much broader consideration of theological approaches and philosophical approaches to understanding language and in particular to a suggestion that human beings tend to perceive um, its significance in one of two ways. One, according to my understanding of the explanation, essentially superficial, and the other involving a much richer, more complex sense of meaning making. While analysis of the precise arguments discussed would be well out with my own competence, this part of the presentation did prompt me to think about an extremely recent development in the secular language of autism, which I feel I should mention briefly as I near the end of my response. This development was the publication just a few days ago of a report in the leading English language medical journal, The Lancet, which included a section suggesting adoption of a new administrative term, profound autism, which could be applied to autistic people with certain characteristics. Um, and I should say that um, the comments I'm about to make refer only to this report in The Lancet and not necessarily to other uses of the term profound autism. What was noteworthy about this report and quickly attracted social media comment was the fact that the features which the authors suggested should allow autism to be classed as profound were in fact not autistic features at all. As the brilliant Twitter commentator Anne Mehmet pointed out, this seems as illogical as declaring any other disability profound by virtue of co-occurrence with a completely separate disability. But logic aside, um, an interesting point for me was the fact that the authors suggested that a different term be used in a language such as Spanish because of the fact that in that language, profundo means deep. To me, to me anyway, personally, this implies that the idea of depth was seen as irrelevant in English, which I find quite surprising because as soon as I think of the word profound, I think of depth and a host of spin-off associations, actually all positive, and many with rich sensory aspects. However, what I mean to highlight here is not so much the potential for positivity in the expression, but the fact that the authors did not discuss the layers of potential meaning in the English word, despite it explicitly mentioning um, interest in sort of connotation. Could this be an example of something between the tagging and deeper approaches to language described by Professor McCaskill, I wonder? Going beyond the issue of attitudes towards language, there is one more thing I should say about this example. Despite the fact that um, the logic of the proposed label of profound autism might not make much sense to me at the moment, 
I hope that I'm open to changing my mind as well as being open to the authors changing their own minds at some future point. And the same is true of the writer I mentioned earlier, who works in the broader field of thought and spirituality. And this idea of changing minds leads me to the concept of repentance discussed by Professor McCaskill. Now, I'm absolutely unqualified to speak about repentance myself as a non-theologian and, in fact, a non-Christian. So instead, I'll limit myself to commenting that while I understand that Christian repentance and secular regret or commitment to change must be very different things, I think that even... Um, Ordinary regret, regret and growth of various kinds uh, provide possibilities for simple worldly reconciliation and healing at least, and ultimately for better realities for all, however we understand these. Now to end on a lighter note, um, I thought it might be worth mentioning here that often true games and play are themselves regarded as channels through which reconciliation and improved understanding and handling of reality can be achieved. And there's perhaps some overlap here with uh, a notion um, mentioned by Professor McCaskill. I quote, uh, language play meanwhile, oh gosh, my pronunciation is going to be wrong, Sprachspiel, uh, allows relationships to be recast and reinterpreted, sometimes serving subversive or transformational goals. When games function in this way, they remind us that games and reality are not always in binary opposition. They can participate in and even provide ways of understating various forms of reality, uh, understanding various forms of reality, and that is worth holding on to, I think. But as I mentioned at the start of this response, the question properly in focus could be paraphrased as something like autism, theology and language, are language experiences and choices truly significant or not from a theological perspective? It seems to me that in his paper, Professor McCaskill made a crystal clear case that language does indeed matter to autistic people in very real ways. And uh, from my position of extremely limited theological understanding, I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your response. Um, Grant, do you want to reply quickly two, three, four minutes to Lisa before we open up the floor to questions? Sure, and, and they won't really be replies so much as, as almost kind of just uh, riffing off some of what, what Lisa said. Uh, I will just make a comment on, first of all, just on the, the language of weird and queer. I'm the same, I, I like the language, I think it's important to affirm it. And it's one of the reasons that I think it's interesting to bring in uh, disciplines and approaches like queer theory that I think have been very sensitive to the the the, the linguistic dimension to this and and to, to actually uh, using that and and almost deliberately flipping the the values that the society throws around um following on from that um the the word repentance this is just a sort of I think for me this is an important comment that I think the word repentance, has largely fallen out of widespread non-theological use today. And, and I think part of the contribution is actually reaffirming it as a category that, that is central to theology, but might be translated and, and disseminated um, more widely within our social discourse. That's what we see within Greek culture, for example, where, where metanoias are widely represented and, and was recognized to be a, a, a frequent reality for people. So I, I think this is. Um, I think part of what I, I want us to see from the theological discourse is something that can resource discourse outside of theology. And part of that is actually allowing these categories to be anchored in theology, but perhaps to, to, to spread beyond them. Um, I'm not gonna say anything about the, the issue of profound autism um, and, and that labeling, other than just to say that I, I really hope to hear more about this um, just now and maybe in later sessions, um, partly because I, I think it's something I'm sort of burdened by. I think I might have used expressions like profoundly affected or severely affected at points in my own research and just because I couldn't find better language. And I think the key is that I really want to hear 
what others feel to be more appropriate language and also um uh, you know I, I guess to be repentant of that language myself if it was something that troubled people the last thing then that i'll say is is just on is to respond to lisa's comment that, that she was really inviting further comment on virtue and selfhood um and i think the only thing i, I want to say about that is that the categories of virtue within, again, both theological and non-theological tradition have been categories where th there's a recognition that there are aspects of our behaviours um, or aspects of our thinking that can stand between us and the, the fullest enjoyment of life or the fullest flourishing within life. Um, and that can be framed theologically in particular ways. Uh, and some ways that we might not particularly like or might not particularly agree with. But what I think is helpful about it is if, if, if we've begun by this theological destabilizing of social expectations and social norms, then instead of going down the route uh, that I think is, is very widespread, where the philosophy of interventions for autistic people, particularly for autistic children, is, is basically about... Uh, enabling them to meet the expectations of society. So enabling them to, to conform with social expectations. And that can, there's plenty of literature on the fact that that can be enormously destructive and enormously distressing for autistic people. So even this, this thing of forcing autistic children to maintain eye contact, um, even though it, it creates incredible distress. Um, but once we destabilize the idea of social convention, I think we reopen a space where we can still talk about the need to address aspects of our thinking and behavior that might stand between us and flourishing. So in my case, for example, um, uh, you know, just to give one example, um, I, I will tend to become very obsessed with things. Um, and my use of screen time, for example, can be really affected by that. So I, you know, I, I bought a chair. Uh, about a year ago and um, was was looking at the same websites over and over again until two or three in the morning and not sleeping, um, just in case any of them had changed in the details of what they were representing about that chair. Um, and that's just a little example and perhaps a silly example, but it, it captures the fact that, that for me, learning about something that's not in any sense a sort of sin or a sinful behavior but it's simply simply a, an aspect of my thinking that stands in the way of flourishing it, it sort of illustrates where uh learning to address our thought patterns that might not necessarily facilitate health um can be part of the discourse but the, the key really is you you have that discourse in a totally different way when you're not thinking about conformity to social standards or to, to some standard of normality um i'll stop there so thanks thanks for the opportunity just to, to say something back thank you very much grant and thanks for adding that personal um example as well i think that's really helpful to to know what you're talking about to understand what you're talking about or at least for me uh, um i'm uh eager to open up the floor for questions from the audience um let me see i i should have said this in the beginning of the session um the, all the sessions in this conference are being recorded and we will make them available later on, uh, but we need to do the captioning and all of that, um, the, the correct, uh, correct the captioning. Um, so that will take a while before they are available, but all sessions are recorded. There was also a question about um, visuals, PowerPoints. Uh, some speakers have them available, some have not. Uh, when they are available, you will see them, of course, on the screen. Um, Grant, I just heard you say that you didn't want to comment uh, much on the on the question about profound autism. Um, nevertheless, that was the first question that came up. And um, I've heard that you want to hear from the audience. So I'm going to ask the question and maybe Lisa, you want to respond to that or uh, and, and Grant, if you feel that you want to say a little bit more, of course, you're welcome to. But can I also invite the audience to to um, reply to Grant in the in the in the Q and A, we will save the Q and A uh, for our own purposes later on, um, so that Grant has a feeling for uh, what he was asking about the use of profound and what, what do people think. The question that came up and came in was, um, 
wait a second, it has disappeared. Um, the, the, the question is, um, what, what are your thoughts about the use of profound rather than severe? And maybe that's a helpful distinction or not. Um, my feeling is that the emphasis on autism draws attention away from the additional co-occurring conditions and fuels public perceptions of autism is tragedy. Autism equals tragedy and, in, and increases, not reduces, stigma. Would a better description be autism with mainly high support needs, for example? Um, Lisa and Grant, um, whoever wants to respond to that. I mean, part of the context for this, for me, uh, fairly early in my journey of thinking about, or thinking about how to write theologically on autism, um, I met with a person in, um, in New York, actually. Um, and um, that person challenged me about the fact that I, I was really championing a very positive account of autism, um, but perhaps in a way that wasn't taking as seriously as it needed to the more difficult aspects of my own experience. Um, so I was almost kind of bracketing them out in a way that, that you know, yes, you know, we're, we're right to, disting to distinguish autism from co-occurring um, conditions. Um, but she felt I was maybe going too far. And also in a, in a way that wasn't necessarily appropriately respectful of um, other people's experience, which, which had been perhaps more extensively negative uh, in terms of some of these conditions. So I think partly my own use of some of that language, I think, reflected trying not to project my own experience onto that of others. And this also, I think, leads to another point that this is not answering the question at all. It's maybe just throwing some further elements in, into the conversation. But uh, you know, in terms of, if you want to say, if you want to ask me about the profundity of my autism, um, you know, it, that doesn't change. It, it's, it's as deep as it is in my neurology all the time. But the negative experiences um, are often contextualized within specific situations. So think things that invoke certain sensory triggers um, or social aspects. Um, I, I will say that I don't think, uh, and this goes back to that third point I made, um, I don't think all of my negative experiences are socially generated. Uh, so that there are aspects that are, are just about my brain looping on things that um, it, it is one of those things I, I need to try and challenge within myself. Um, but I, I think it is helpful to recognize that what they're labeling as profound is, is uh, uh, a, a particular kind of negative experience. And the point really I'm making is, is that those negative experiences might be socially contextualized or, or particularized around certain events. Lisa, I've not done a very good job of articulating that. If you, if you want to come back and say something more on that. Um, I don't. I'd only say that. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to to hearing what others have to say. And um, yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Thanks. I, I think uh, there there is a lot of questions coming in, so we should move on to to the next question, maybe. Um, but this is certainly a discussion that is um, to be continued. I think. Um, Another question about language here. Um, to what extent do you think that use of language can differ in terms of appropriateness in terms of context? For example, I'm a left-handed person and it would be odd to describe me as having left-handedness. However, if you are studying left-handedness, it might be appropriate to talk of it in isolation, as it were, of any partic uh, particular person. Grant. Um. I don't know that I've got really anything to say. I, I, I think the observation was a good one and an interesting one. Um, and obviously at its heart is this, this point that you wouldn't necessarily talk about a person with left-handedness. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think I've really got, I, I think it was a, it's a good observation rather than necessarily something that invites a question, but Lisa might have heard the question more clearly than I did. 
Um, gosh, yes, I, I would really have to think about the comparison of autism and left handedness. I'm afraid to say I don't know enough about left handedness to comment is how I would answer that. I'm sorry. I, I, I might say one thing, though, if, if, if it can come in. Um, there is this interesting thing about left handed, <laughs> sorry to any left handed people about this background, but you know, there, there is this historical thing of, of the language of sinister being associated with, with leftedness, left handedness. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it's an example of something that for us has become completely neutralized as a concept, but historically wasn't as neutral a concept as it is now. Um, so, so it, it may be an okay. window onto the evolution of language. Um, here's an interesting comment in the, in the Q&A. Um, I, th I think that's helpful maybe to bring into the discussion at this point. Uh, isn't the idea of finding a term part of the desire to put people in boxes? Uh, just because I don't need high support to wash and dress doesn't mean I'm not profoundly, positively and negatively affected. Um, maybe that's just a comment I don't know, but um, that might be helpful here. Um, there, there are some questions about uh, the use of disability in language. Um, so, for example, here I've got one question that I'm looking at. At, uh, how does the acceptance of the term disability and Taylor's understanding of constructive language interact? By owning the disabled label, as I would want to endorse also, how do we resist a process that disables further? Any thoughts, Grants or Lisa? Um. I'm not, I'm not going to answer that because I'm, I, that's, that's a huge question and I'm not sure that I can answer it. Lisa might have more to say to that because of her experience with um, in, in involvement with, with active advocacy. Can I just go back quickly, though, to, to that last observation about putting people in boxes? Yeah. Um, because it, it's just a comment that I think that's absolutely right and I think it's really important. At the same time, I think the, the, the driver behind all of this, and I think this, this came out in, in what Lisa was talking about, the driver behind all of this is, is precisely a, a sort of administrative need to put people in boxes, to put them in categories in order to um, determine the kinds of support that, that they get. Um, and I think part of our task is, is to acknowledge what's going on there while also resisting something that um, be becomes unwittingly dehumanizing of, of the people involved. Through 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 boxing. Thanks for that, Lisa. Lisa, do you want to comment on that disabled uh, disability question? Oh, Owning gosh. that label does that disable further, maybe? Right. Um. So so I have to confess that I have never read the work of Charles Taylor. I only know the name through Grant's paper. I must of course chase up the reference. So could you possibly repeat the question, and I'll see if I can make something of it without referring back to that literature. Sure. How does the acceptance of the term disability and Taylor's understanding of constructive language interact? And then I think the question, the point here, by owning the disabled label, as I wouldn't want to endorse also, how do we resist, how do we resist a process that disables further? Ah, right. So as I understand the question, it's um, is, is um, Using the word disabled, a sort of double-edged sword. Are there risks, perhaps, in in using the word uh, disabled? Um, gosh, I'm not sure. I I would I would give the escape answer, which is it would depend on context. Oh dear, that's a terrible answer. I, um, I myself um, would would say I I suppose I don't often use the word disabled of myself, but I would sometimes you know refer to a disability I read, I read and, ha and have done recently and um, in my personal experience it actually it has been um, always positive but um, yeah I'm so sorry that that is the escape route answer which is it would depend on context I think how do you avoid it becoming a double-edged sword but thank you for the question thank you can I maybe uh, something occurred to me just as, as Lisa was talking there that um, might be useful um, and, and it's bringing in at, at least the conversation around the different models that can be used for disability. So, you know, we, we talk about medical models versus social models. Um, and e even if we don't necessarily want to 
um, want to adopt a single model over against others, you know, we might we might allow for a range of models to be part of the discourse. I think just being attentive to to the discourse around what what is indicated by a social model, where um, the the disable the disabling is, is never simply about the 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 individual who is labelled disabled, um, but it's about a complex of of uh, what happens with that person's experience in the world, so that there's always a social dimension, um, and I think being alert to that. Uh, I, I think can be a useful part of affirming the language without without it necessarily sliding into something more more negative. Thank you. Um, it's almost time, Grant. I've got one question for you. If you can answer it within one minute, because then I do have a couple of housekeeping uh, things to say, and then uh, it's really time to wrap up the session. Uh, so here's your uh, one minute <laughs> one minute answer question. Um, I've got a question for Grant. What are his thoughts on how spiritual leaders might adjust language in referring to autism and their autistic congregation? Um, <clears throat> one minute. Yeah. That's not a one minute question. Um, read, read more stuff by autistic people, I think, is, is the, probably the, the, the key tip, because I, I think the tendency is to read stuff written about autistic people um and to assume that they will prefer certain kinds of language but i think reading more stuff by autistic people and using social media can be helpful to get access to that although it's it's it's, it's a very sort of combative environment often thank you very much grant um all right um can i just thank you so much grant and lisa for your wonderful contribution for opening this conference with uh, with this important topic on language uh, I, I think that um, that is really something that we will need to keep in mind throughout the, the conference, and it, it's it's one way, one one particular topic that is foundational for um, this emerging conversation on autism and theology. So thank you ever so much, Grant and Lisa, for your contributions. I do have a couple of housekeeping um, uh, things to say. Um, so after each of the sessions in this conference. Um, Everyone is welcome to join the wonder.me room. Um, you will have received an email with a link to that, and I think the link will appear in the chat as well in a moment. Um, that is um, a space that is offered for you to socialize if you want. Um, it is not very heavily monitored by the organization. So um, please keep polite, keep respectful towards each other. Um, Either Rachel Denley, Sarah Manon, or myself will be there um, at any time, or at least that's what we are trying to, just in case there are any issues that you want to report. If you want to report any issue, you can send a private message in the Wonder Me room um, by um, hovering over our names, I think, or find us in the, in the chat function, and there you can private message us. Um, yes. And then um, one more thing you will have read in your email about the green batch function. I just want to reiterate what that is. So if you think you might find it difficult to approach another person or group and start to chat, you can choose to put the word green in brackets after your name when you enter the room. For example, I would enter Leon van Omen and then in between brackets uh, green. This will form your digital uh, green batch. Green batches will not be visible on the participants' icons, though. So if you are going to the Wonder Me room, you will appear there with your with your photograph, but it's rather small and there is no um, no name attached to that. That, but you can see that in the chat. So um, green. So, however, if you look at the participant list when you enter the room, you will be able to see who has chosen to wear a green badge indicating they think they might find it difficult to start a chat, but would like to do so. So those, um, if you don't have a green badge and you feel comfortable reaching out to other people, maybe you can look for people wearing a green badge and initiate the conversation. There are a couple of rooms in the Wonder Me room um, around specific topics. You can suggest other topics, maybe um, by the private message to Rachel or Sarah or myself. Um, or if you don't want to enter a specific room, you can just stay outside of those rooms in the general area. And um, 
I wish you a happy chatting. So thank you again for this session. And um, I hope to see many of you back in an hour for our next session, which is with the recent authors in this emerging field of autism and theology. Thank you.